Josh Judd is the CTO for Warp Mechanics, and here he is, Josh Judd. Hello. So we have, uh, ah, laser, good. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've used a Luster ZFS hybrid uh, in a production context uh, for media and entertainment. So this is commercial luster, not uh, HPC luster. Uh, we've been working with the media and entertainment industry since uh, 2010, but mostly using Quantum Stornext. So uh, putting ZFS raids underneath a parallel file system is our wheelhouse. Uh, doing it with Luster is uh, relatively new to us, but we started doing it last year. <clears throat> uh, I can't really talk about the specific customer. Uh, a lot of the Hollywood studios are quite proprietary about how they do things and uh, so forth. So I can talk about how the workflow uh, interacts with Luster and how the Luster ZFS hybrid provides an advantage for that kind of commercial uh, environment. <clears throat> now, we're doing something a, a little bit differently than uh, Livermore is currently doing with Luster ZFS Hybrid. We're actually running ZFS as the RAID layer, not as a uh, replacement for EXT4 as the uh, backing file system for the OST. Uh, we intend to do both, ultimately. Uh, we were basically waiting for the ZFS Luster stuff to get fully developed by Livermore. But in the meantime, we've been running ZFS as the RAID layer on a separate RAID controller. Essentially where Livermore had in their diagram uh, the NetApp controllers, that's our ZFS uh, layer. So it's, we're, we're going at it in exactly the opposite direction uh, of Livermore in a sense. <coughs> but Ultimately, we do set Luster on top of ZFS, so the end result is uh, uh, very similar. The biggest problem with using Luster in a media and entertainment uh, customer environment is that the uh, movie studios or gaming companies don't necessarily use Linux as a uniform operating system. In fact, there's a lot more Mac OS and Windows. So we've experimented with a few different modes of getting um, Luster support. Obviously, you can do uh, SMB or NFS, but um, we've recently started putting <coughs> the client operating system as a virtual machine on top of a Linux layer running uh, the KVM hypervisor. So the um, hypervisor layer can be a native Luster client, which gets you considerably better performance than if you're just uh, having a Windows box connecting to a gateway using SMB. So I, I guess the takeaway here is that somehow you have to solve the multi-OS support a little bit better than uh, just throwing uh, SMB at it. That approach doesn't work as well from a um, legal standpoint if you're using Mac OS. I know uh, uh, a number of people in the room use Hackintosh kind of uh, approaches, but that's not uh, something that we can sell because we don't want to get stomped on by Apple, which they will do. <coughs> so what does ZFS get you in the media and entertainment uh, context? Well, obviously the hybrid storage is a really big thing. The ability to use the ZFS uh, L2 ARC feature to get a large amount of data cached onto SSDs. The ZFS intent log, or ZIL, uh, vastly improves write performance. <coughs> but uh, surprisingly, I found that media customers reacted very strongly to the data integrity features of ZFS, the block level checksums. Now, uh, anytime you're doing a, a big data style environment, you turn the corner case possibility of corruption into a daily event. 
So uh, obviously having enhanced integrity features is a good thing, but media and entertainment customers usually just don't care if a red pixel is turned slightly pink, right? Um, you know, like if you get a, a flipped bit in a, in a movie, it's like, whatever. Um, but so th this is why I was a little surprised at uh, how much they liked that feature. But uh, apparently there's a, a lot of uh, growing paranoia in the movie industry about how data corruption is going to start uh, um, affecting uh, the much larger and higher resolution movie formats that are, that are coming out. <coughs> uh, so primary benefits are performance and integrity. Uh, obviously open storage overall lowers cost, so compared to OEM hardware RAID implementations, our ZFS uh, controllers are vastly less expensive. Um, so this isn't a marketing talk, but just the, the notion of using open software as your RAID stack does save money. <coughs> now, because we didn't have the ZFS on Linux stuff hardened and fully production supportable, um, we felt that ZFS was supportable on Solaris, since that's where it came from, whereas Luster was supportable on Linux. So since we've been doing this for a year now, the question is how have we been doing it for a year when these are uh, uh, kind of incompatible approaches? You could port Luster to Solaris. I don't think any of us are gonna go do that. <laughs> That's not, not really my agenda. Uh, ZFS to Linux, uh, we absolutely support doing this, but it wasn't there yet. And um, the other option is to use ZFS on Solaris as a RAID controller under Luster on Linux. That's what we did. We essentially put uh, <coughs> ZFS RAID on a se physically separate CPU-based RAID controller hooked it up using uh, RDMA to the object storage server. So you get RDMA performance, direct connect RDMA performance from a pure Luster uh, on Linux to a pure ZFS on Solaris. So you get the fully baked and hardened ZFS and the fully baked and hardened uh, um, Luster uh, with um, very um, tightly coupled performance between the two, yet enough separation that you don't get bugs from one bleeding into the other, I guess you could say. <coughs> so that's why we focused on the third option. We think ultimately you would, the ideal architecture for us would be doing both, having ZFS on the OSS to provide the benefits uh, Livermore talked about, uh, larger OSTs, et cetera. Uh, but also having the ZFS RAID on the RAID controller layer. So how does that actually look? Uh, multiple RAID boxes hooked up to multiple HA OSS pairs with a direct connect from each RAID controller to an associated OSS. Uh, within the RAID box, you get ZFS intent log for write acceleration, L2 arc for read acceleration, and in our box, uh, this is like a 4U box, we can fit an additional 200 terabytes of uh, hard drive capacity. So you get the accelerators and you also get the hard drives, 200 terabytes in 4U, it's uh, a, a fairly dense solution, which is also very important for the media and entertainment customers because of uh, some fairly uh, um, aggressive advances in uh, movie resolution uh, associated with 3D and 60 frames per second and, and, and so forth. Uh, they're really looking to get the highest density they can possibly get while still maintaining performance. So what does that look like in this particular customer environment? Unlike traditional HPC systems, a large file system uh, for a commercial customer is not usually gonna be tens of petabytes. So the, the scalability goal is well within Luster's uh, capability. Uh, this particular file system is about three petabytes and that's considered you know, quite large. <coughs> Advantage to us of going to Luster and away from Quantum Storenext is that Storenext kind of falls down after the first petabyte. Uh, the, the metadata performance just, eh, right. Um, 
whereas these days customers need to exceed a petabyte and are moving towards tens of petabytes over the next couple of years. We don't really think that Quantum Storenex can keep up with that uh, scalability requirement. But this is really the big win uh, for media and entertainment in combining Luster with ZFS. Uh, in order to get really good random read performance out of Luster is kind of difficult. It's really good at sustained writes, uh, not necessarily as good at sustained random reads, particularly if some of them are small I.O. So using the L2ARC feature of ZFS, we're able to get a very large amount of data onto SSD. And this is managed automagically um, with some minor enhancements we've done to the uh, ZFS uh, caching algorithms. So uh, you can, in fact, uh, you know, send various uh, 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 real-time kernel tweaks at the ZFS layer to change how it's um, uh, injecting data onto the L2ARC uh, uh, SSDs to make it, you know, um, probably 95% hit rate on read cache hits. So uh, basically the hard drives become almost an HSM solution in that you're writing to the spinning magnetic stuff, uh, but you almost never read back off of it, <laughs> right? So the challenges moving forward, um, well, there's, there's the, whoops. There's the continual ingest of large files at high speed, but uh, you know that's not really outside the standard luster wheelhouse. So the question is, how do you simultaneously have large uh, random reads of the file system that's continuing to get the large sequential writes? And this is where the L2 arc stuff comes in. Uh, current architecture is fine for that. Um, you know, we're getting a tenth, we're getting Apparently my laser is, okay. Uh, <clears throat> tens of terabytes uh, uh, per project, uh, the number of projects currently on the file system. It, you know, it works out well to keep the entire working data set on SSD within the uh, warp rate arrays. But the movie industry is moving towards 60 frames a second, uh, um, 3D, so two. <laughs> um, and uh, higher resolution per frame. It basically adds up to a couple hundred terabytes for a single movie before you've done special effects, before you've done you know, sound editing and, and, and so on and so on. Uh, this is where we will be enhancing it uh, by putting uh, additional SSDs into the OSS themselves. So we think that the ZFS uh, L2 art capability is is very interesting, but we also um, are are any of you guys familiar with the Facebook flash cache software? So we think that uh, integrating Luster with flash cache is uh, really how you're going to get the much larger read ca read caches in OSSs. Okay, so that's how you basically handle. Uh, read caching within a w uh, within this media system, we have uh, 10 terabytes of uh, ZFS L2 ARC currently uh, in each for you enclosure. Uh, together, well, after RAID overhead, it's 150 terabytes usable uh, uh, capacity. So that gets you, you know, 10 per a um, little less than 10 percent of your uh, total capacity on read optimized SSD. But when you move to those larger movie formats, you're going to need um, essentially flash cache uh, SSD within the OSSs as well to get the the uh, um, uh, SSD uh, read cache up to a large enough level. <clears throat> okay, so you know how does this net out? Uh, we get random reads to accelerate with uh, SSDs. We get uh, uh, ZFS uh, kernel tweaks to make that useful. If all you do out of, out of this talk is turn on L2 ARC, uh, I should you know warn you it's not going to do anything really useful. Uh, the ZFS default algorithms for using the read cache SSDs just don't 
do anything that, that most customers would, would benefit from. <clears throat> okay, so the full system looks like this. Uh, high speed data sources, movie cameras, things that don't have luster clients. I, I, I would like it if movie cameras had luster client, but they don't. Uh, so those has, have to go through luster client gateways uh, to write into the file system. Uh, the L2 arc kernel tweaks uh, essentially prioritize getting all of the writes onto SSDs immediately uh, instead of just a certain percentage of them. Um, and then, uh, yeah, uh, scales out pretty much as much as you want. This particular client only needed 16 uh, uh, OSSs. <clears throat> so uh, how does this really help the movie industry? Well, there's uh, vast cost savings. I mean, um, I don't want to kind of get into specifics since this isn't a, a, a marketing pitch, but open storage as a RAID controller does uh, save a lot of money. And if you're buying petabytes and petabytes and petabytes of data, it adds up pretty fast. Um, <clears throat> but this gets you a set of features that are uh, superior to most uh, commercial uh, hardware RAIDs. Uh, as the Xyrotex person pointed out, uh, the software RAID community can always out-innovate the hardware RAID community because in hardware RAID, you have to wait a year and a half to spin a new ASIC every time you want to add a, a feature, whereas software you just uh, install a new package. So it gives the uh, movie making community advanced features at a lower cost. <clears throat> now, it, it would be one thing if they just pocket the money and call it a day, but I think the best way to do it is to spend that on more uh, solid state disks for read cache and more NVRAM modules for the uh, write accelerators. Uh, we, we don't actually use SSDs for the ZFS intent log. We found that was a, a bad plan. They tend to burn up. Uh, so we actually use NVRAM modules that are in a SAS hard drive form factor. It's basically DRAM with a, uh, 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 bat well, it's not a battery, it's a super cap and uh, uh, enough capa capacity in the e capacitor, capacity in the capacitor, uh, to hibernate the DRAM onto an internal SSD uh, if the RAID crashes. Okay. All right, so in the three minutes before lunch, we have a question. Thanks. I was just curious, the um, art. In several of your slides, you showed the RDMA between the OSS and the um, the CFS RAID appliance, if you want to call it that. Um, that's uh, SRP over InfiniBand, or what is the? Yes, uh, it's a direct connect. Currently, we're using QDR InfiniBand uh, from a performance standpoint. Going to FDR didn't buy us anything, and the driver support for the Mellanox uh, QDR card is better in Solaris at this point. Uh, so the question was, since we're not on the microphone, Solaris is providing the SRP target. Uh, Solaris, per se, doesn't. Uh, Comstar does. <laughs> so, but the base OS on which we're running Comstar is Solaris, and that's uh, where we get the uh, QDR um, HCA driver. So. so I see you mentioned Linux and KVM as the way to kind of send data to your Windows clients and also something about this not working on Mac OS, I'm, I'm not sure why, but did you look into the libluster? It certainly works as a client on Mac OS and you can marry that to Fuse and then you will have a native file system on your Mac client without any virtual machines and stuff and in addition to that, libluster actually kind of, you can run it on in embedded environments, Cray certainly did it before, so that might be your camera solution. Okay, uh, so I would suggest you stop by the uh, warp booth uh, over there during a break, since that's way more detail than I can uh, uh, talk about in, in 30 seconds, but the short answer on why Mac OS uh, isn't supportable on that, it's, it's nothing technical, it's that 
Apple states that you're in violation of your, of your support license and their copyright if you put any form of Mac OS on any hardware other than Apple hardware. And there have been recent court cases in which they asserted that and won. Uh, you know, essentially shut down vendors who were trying to put Mac OS onto non-Apple hardware. So for a government-run supercomputing lab, maybe you have the resources to fight that particular legal fight and win, but, you know, a vendor such as myself has to uh, be a little more careful of violating others' copyrights. So. All right. Thank you, Josh. Thank you.